Sunday was a deeply religious day for the Biden administration. They celebrated a religion celebrated by so many across the country, the religion of deep, insane progressivism. So, of course, Sunday was Easter, the holiest day on the Christian calendar. And the Biden administration decided it was deeply necessary for them to put out a bunch of messaging over the weekend, including on Easter Sunday, about the trans day of visibility. So to explain what the hell the trans day of visibility is, you have to understand that it's one of many, many, like dozens of holidays all around the world about the trans peoples, about people who are gender dysphoric or who believe that they are members of the opposite sex. This holiday was founded by a person named Rachel Crandall Crocker, a psychotherapist, because that's the way that the psychotherapy industry now works. This person says that he knew he was trans since the age of eight. And now the president of the United States pays homage to people like Rachel Crandall Crocker. Here is a clip of uh, Rachel Crandall Crocker explaining uh, his, his origin story here. I tried to come out to my parents when I was eight years old, okay? And that was in 1967. Let's just say it didn't go well. Well, I mean, I can imagine it not going particularly well. Uh, Joe Biden then put out a statement on Transgender Day of Visibility. Which again, I don't even know what that means, day of visibility. Because if there's one thing we know about transgender people in modern America, people who believe they're members of the opposite sex, they don't get enough attention. They need more attention. We need to have an entire day of visibility. As opposed to, you know, like just seeing people around you. There's a day of visibility. So the president of the United States put out a statement, quote, today we send a message to all transgender Americans. You are loved. You are heard. You are understood. You belong. You are America. And my entire administration and I have your back. Joe Biden continues. Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim March 31st, 2024, as Transgender Day of Visibility. I call upon all Americans to join us in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout our nation and to work toward eliminating violence and discrimination based on gender identity. Gender identity is, of course, the nonsense notion that you can identify as something other than what you are. In witness, this is the best part. In witness whereof, I have heretofore set my hand this 29th day of March in the year of our Lord, 2024, and of independence of the United States of America, the 248th. So my favorite part of this is where Joe Biden mentions the year of our Lord. That would be Jesus, right? Because we all keep the Christian calendar. I, I like that part where he mentions the year of our Lord on Easter, which again is the holiest day in the Christian calendar, to celebrate Transgender Day of Visibility. The president also put up a bunch of tweets along these lines to celebrate. It's a very important time. Quote, on Transgender Day of Visibility, we celebrate the joy, strength, and absolute courage of some of the bravest people I know. People so brave that if you say that they are actually a member of their own biological sex, then apparently an outsized number that they kill themselves. This is the actual case that the left is constantly making when it comes to gender dysphoria is that we all have to pretend along or people will kill themselves. And Joe Biden calls this joy, strength and absolute courage and bravery. Again, as I've said over the years, when it comes to the pantheon of American bravery, it goes like transgender people saying that they are members of the opposite sex. They're like all the way up here. And then running a distant second is 18 year old boys charging the beaches of Normandy on behalf of the allies. I mean, it like. They, they really shouldn't even be in the same category. I mean, we know where the real bravery is. Joe Biden says today we show millions of transgender and non-binary Americans, not just transgender people, people who identify as no gender or between the genders that we see them. They belong. They should be treated with dignity and respect. And then big pink and blue graphic trans rights are human rights. This was put out on Easter morning at 11 a.m. We should note at this point that this is, in fact, the religion of the Biden administration. Not, not just that. He put out another tweet at 2 p.m. Just to make sure that you got it, right? Not, they, they put out one at 11 on Easter. Then at 2 p.m. on Easter, again, on Easter, the holiest day in the Christian... I'm not going to say this yeah, uh, enough. This is the holiest day in the Christian calendar. I'm just going to point out that the perspective of the Biden administration when it comes to holy days on the calendar goes something like this. You're not allowed to kill terrorists during Ramadan because if you do, it'll offend Muslims. But you are certainly allowed to pay homage to the notion that men can be women on Easter, that's, that, that's how different religions are treated by this White House. So President Biden puts out a tweet, quote, today on Transgender Day of Visibility, I have a simple message to all trans Americans. I see you, which is not creepy. That's apparently uplifting. You are made in the image of God and you're worthy of respect and dignity. 
Okay, every person is made in the image of God. Also, they are made male and female. It's literally in the same verse in Genesis. My favorite part when Joe Biden says things like, you're made in the image of God. The final part of that verse is male and female, he made them. Literally the same verse. Just read to the end of the sentence, my dude. In any case, the religion of this administration obviously is not Christianity or even some sort of broader secular version of Christian values. It is, in fact, just wild progressivism. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. First, the cost of living has already increased 17% this year. It continues to rise despite interest rate controls. As our national debt continues to skyrocket, you need to be confident in the financial services companies you work with, especially regarding your future and your money. Birch Gold is a proven industry leader you want on your side. They demonstrate how precious metals investments can fortify your lifestyle and retirement, even in turbulent economic times. Birch Gold understands that navigating financial decisions can be daunting. That's why their expertise, coupled with their customer care process, ensures that your purchase or IRA setup is a breeze. If you're considering converting an existing retirement account into a precious metals IRA, their dedicated in-house IRA department is there to guide you every step of the way, making the process feel as simple as a walk in the park. Birch Gold values your questions and concerns. Their team is always available to provide answers and clarity, whether it's about fees, taxes on rollovers, or the timing of the process. They're here to ensure you feel heard and informed. Text Ben to 989898 to talk to one of Birch Gold's experts and claim your free info kit on gold. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. The best part is it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Just text Ben to 989898. That's Ben to 989898. According to Fox News, children of the National Guard were prohibited from submitting religious Easter egg designs for the 2024 Celebrating National Guard Families art event at the White House. So it's Easter and people were painting crosses on eggs. And Joe Biden's like, no, none of that. The only the only symbols we will allow here are like the Pride Progress flag flying from the giant rotunda of the White House. The art contest is part of the White House's Easter traditions, which include the annual Easter egg roll. The flyer for the contest states that an Easter egg design submission, quote, must not include any questionable content, religious symbols, overtly religious themes, or partisan political statements. So just going to point out that if you, I assume that if you put trans flag colors on the Easter egg, totally fine. That is not a partisan political statement. It is not a piece of questionable content or religious symbol. You just have to make sure that everything is, you know, on the up and up with the secular left. That is, that is the religion of this White House. By the way, this isn't just the White House. Kathy Hochul decided over the weekend that it was very important to light up buildings in New York in the trans colors. According to Colin Rugg, New York governor, Kathy Hochul has ordered that New York landmarks be lit up in transgender flag colors on Easter Sunday. She issued a proclamation declaring March 31st, 2024, Transgender Day of Visibility. The landmarks that are now apparently trans are Niagara Falls, One World Trade Center, Empire State Plaza, Plaza, Kazuyoko, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Kazuyoko Bridge, Kazuyoko Bridge, the State Education Building, and more. Governor Kathy Hochul today issued a proclamation declaring it Trans Day of Visibility. It's very important that everyone across the land know that men who believe that they are women are in fact women. And Kathy Hochul will make you see that at the top of the Empire State Building on Easter Day, on Easter Day. So President Trump then put out a statement. And the statement was from Carolyn Levitt, his national press secretary. It said, it is appalling and insulting that Joe Biden's White House prohibited children from submitting religious egg designs for their Easter art event and formerly proclaimed Easter Sunday as Trans Day of Visibility. Sadly, these are just two more examples of the Biden administration's years long assault on the Christian faith. We call on Joe Biden's failing campaign and White House to issue an apology to the millions of Catholics and Christians across America who believe tomorrow is for one celebration only, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, again, the Trump statement is correct. That is obviously what the Biden administration is doing. Now, there are a lot of people out there saying, well, this is a made up. It's a made up problem because after all, it's March 31st every year. Let me ask you, if March 31st, if Trans Day of Visibility were to fall on, say, Juneteenth by some sort of random coincidence, do you think that the White House would put both of those messages out at the same time? Which particular religious messages does the White House mirror? So the White House responded to these complaints, suggesting that this is all just about anti-trans rhetoric. It's not about defacing Easter with a bunch of blasphemous nonsense that happens to be anti-science also. The White House then suggested that Republicans are nasty. So White House spokesperson Andrew Bates said, quote, as a Christian who celebrates Easter with family, President Biden, uh, first of all, whenever Joe Biden whips out his Christianity to use as a club right after supporting taxpayer funded abortion, Transing of the children and same-sex marriage. It's a little odd. It's a little strange. 
As a Christian who celebrates Easter with family, President Biden stands for bringing people together and upholding the dignity and freedoms of every American. Sadly, it's unsurprising politicians are seeking to divide and weaken our country with cruel, hateful, dishonest rhetoric. President Biden will never abuse his faith for political purposes or for profit. He literally abuses his faith for political purposes pretty much every time he cites his Catholicism in defense of his pro-abortion positions. I do look forward to the White House's Christmas Day statement in favor, I assume, of partial birth abortion in celebration of partial birth abortion on the day Jesus was born. I think probably they're actually going to do that. That's, that, that's, that. That seems probable at this point. So Biden then put out an Easter message, a piece of damage control. Joe Biden put out a statement saying, quote, Jill and I send our warmest wishes to Christians around the world celebrating Easter Sunday. Easter reminds us of the power of hope and the promise of Christ's resurrection. As we gather with loved ones, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. We pray for one another and cherish the blessing of a dawn of new possibilities with wars and conflicts taking a toll on innocent lives around the world. We renew our commitment to work for peace, security, and dignity for all people. From our family to yours, happy Easter and may God bless you. Okay, but the left went even further than that. The left decided that anyone who opposed the conflation of quote unquote trans day of visibility and Easter, these are people who apparently are cruel bigots. Not just that. Apparently, according to these same people, Jesus would have himself been a super big proponent, it turns out, of the trans ideology. Now, where they get this from, I have no idea. Jesus, it turns out, for those who have even a cursory knowledge of the New Testament, I'm not a Christian, but I've read the New Testament. Jesus is a pretty judgmental guy, he has some rules. Turns out, not every behavior is approved by Jesus. Nonetheless, here was David Jolly on MSNBC suggesting, former Florida Republican Party representative, the kind who's welcome on MSNBC, he's earned some strange new respect. Here he was suggesting Jesus would have been totally cool with the transgenderism. Uh, I think we got to hit it head on and suggest to President Trump and Mike Johnson and Senator Blackburn and others who are relying on the words of their Christ and their Jesus they celebrate today to condemn Joe Biden, uh, to suggest to them that actually the Jesus they celebrate today would be inclusive of the transgender community and would be supportive of the transgender community and demand all Christians, including Donald Trump, Mike Johnson, and others who celebrate today, that in fact they should love the transgender community as they love their own God. Okay, um, no, that is wrong. So uh, again, I'm not going to speak for Christians here because I'm not one. But I am going to say I have at least more knowledge about this than David Jolly does, apparently. We'll get some more on this in just one moment. First, do you owe back taxes or still have unfiled returns? Not only is owing back taxes stressful, but the IRS has also become more determined than ever to come after you. The IRS's chief data and analytics officer revealed they're focused on an enforcement project with an average return on investment of about six bucks for every one dollar spent. They're targeting individuals and businesses that currently owe back taxes or haven't filed their returns first. Tax Network USA, the nation's leading tax relief firm, knows the tax code. They'll fight for you. With a record of negotiating over a billion dollars in tax relief for their clients, their team is knowledgeable in handling any type of tax issue. Whether you owe $10,000 or $10 million, they can help. Even if you don't have all your personal or business records from over the years, they can get you filed up to date. Facing the IRS without a professional, not a smart move. Contact Tax Network USA for the best strategic advice to help reduce or even eliminate your tax debt. Call today, 1-800-245-6000, or visit their website at tnusa.com slash Shapiro. They'll give you a free private consultation on how you can settle your tax debt today. That's tnusa.com slash Shapiro, tnusa.com slash Shapiro. So Jesus, my understanding is, and correct me, we have a, we have a producer's room full of Christians, Catholics and Protestants. Let, let me just ask very quickly, it is my impression, and correct me again if I am wrong, that Jesus loved the sinner, but not the sin. That when, that, that, when, that when Jesus actually, for example, was seeking to reach out to Mary Magdalene, a former prostitute, the idea wasn't that she should go and sin more. It was go and sin no more. Right? That the idea was that now you had to give up the sin. I thought that was the idea, as opposed to Jesus loves everyone as they, that's paganism. Jesus loves you just as you are, the way you are. Jesus may love you, and according to Christianity, but he doesn't love you the way that you are in terms of action, because that would suggest that he likes your actions. He loves you as a human being with a soul, a divine soul. That, that is, I mean, again, this is coming from a non-Christian, but I don't think it takes all that much knowledge about Christianity to understand how stupid and wrong this is. But this is the entire left-wing point of view, is that Jesus is basically some sort of Eastern mystic who has no judgmental philosophy whatsoever on human action. And I'm just wondering where they're getting that from in the New Testament. 
Jesus began life as a Jew. He lived as a Jew. And it turns out Judaism has some things to say about these particular matters as well. Nonetheless, this is the take of left Molly Jongfast, who when I when I need a, a hot take on Christianity, I go to Molly Jongfast. She says, well, Joe Biden is a great Christian. He's a great Christian. We know that because he's been married for a super long time as opposed to Donald Trump, who's married for three times. Now, listen, Joe Biden's marriage, his marital record, may be better than Donald Trump's marital record. That has literally nothing to do with whether he's promulgating anti-Christian nonsense on Easter. The Republicans seem not so interested in that. I mean, they spent the whole weekend attacking Biden because Trans Visibility Day went was the, on the same day as Easter, you know, because it's always on March 31st. Mm -hmm. So I do think there was quite, you know, there seems to be no alliance. You know, there seems to be no uh, it just seems to be that the far right doesn't care that Biden is right. this religious Catholic and that Trump has all these marriages and. It just seems like they just don't care. It's a false equivalency. Yeah. It's a false equivalency. I'll tell you what makes you not a particularly religious person. What makes you not a particularly religious person is if you don't actually care about your own religious precepts and you constantly violate them in the name of political power. And then you seek to rely on your religion in order to justify that. That's actually bearing false witness. It's one of the Ten Commandments that you're not supposed to violate. You're not supposed to misuse your religion to simply promulgate your political priors when they are in direct conflict with overt Catholic theology, for example. Joe Biden isn't just a Christian. Joe Biden is a Catholic, which means that he is subject to the actual diktats of the Pope, for example. And it turns out that the Vatican has been really, really clear on issues like abortion for literally all of the existence of the Vatican. The Vatican has been extremely clear on the issue of, say, transgenderism, since that even was mentioned as a possible idea, which was pretty recently because it's a dumb idea. The Vatican has been pretty clear on matters related to same-sex marriage. Joe Biden violates all of those. So again, like th this, I love this idea where you can be like an amazing Catholic while constantly using political power in order to mine every fundamental basis of the religion you purport to observe. That's a very weird take, but this is the take. Right? Jonathan Capehart, again, going to lecture all of us about religion. Being lectured about religion by the folks on MSNBC is legitimately like being lectured on how to eat a steak by members of PETA. Here's Jonathan Capehart. And therein lies the difference between Biden, an actual man of faith who goes to church virtually every Sunday, and Trump, who cloaks himself in Christianity in order to not only use religion as a weapon, but also as a blasphemous money-making opportunity. Okay, he is a, he's the blasphemer because he is selling some sort of branded Bible. Now, you don't have to love Donald Trump selling a branded Bible in order to recognize that that is still taking the Bible more seriously than Joe Biden does every single day. And there, there's a cardinal named Wilton Gregory who is on the TVs on Sunday pointing out that when it comes to the manipulation of religion, it turns out that Joe Biden manipulates religion literally all the time and says things in the name of his Catholicism that simply are not true. In the case of the president, do you get a sense that his regular attendance and adherence to the faith resonates with American Catholics? I would say that he's very sincere about his faith, but like a number of Catholics, he picks and chooses dimensions of the faith to highlight while ignoring or even contradicting other parts. There are things that he chooses to ignore or he uses the, uh, the current situation as a political pawn rather than saying, look, my church believes this. That is correct, obviously. We'll get to more on this in just one moment. First, spring is here. That means spring cleaning, warmer weather. The flowers and leaves are beginning to bloom. So, of course, you should be thinking about that. I'm just joking, but you actually should. You should be thinking about life insurance with Policy Genius. Getting life insurance today means you'll have peace of mind. So if something were to happen to you, your family can cover expenses while getting back on their feet. Luckily, Policy Genius helps you compare options from top companies and their team of licensed experts on hand to help you talk through it. Policy Genius has licensed award-winning agents and technology that makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have life insurance through work, it might not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it might not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, 
You can find life insurance policies starting at just 292 bucks per year for a million dollars in coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies, which means they don't have the incentive to recommend one insurer over another. Save time, save money, provide your family with financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. By the way, just add some insult to injury. Joe Biden didn't just celebrate Trans Day of Visibility on Easter. He also celebrated Cesar Chavez. Like he actually put out a tweet in the middle of Easter. Again, it's like, are there, is there any more? I feel like my cousin Vinny here. Is there any more bleep we can load into this? Day? He tweeted out yesterday, like 4.47 p.m., quote, Today, we honor Cesar Chavez by carrying on the cause to which he dedicated his life, championing the dignity and rights of every worker, using nonviolence to fight for justice and standing with organized labor to build an economy that rewards work and not just wealth. I mean, put aside Cesar Chavez's views on illegal immigration, which are very different from Joe Biden's views on illegal immigration since he was a labor leader and did not like illegal immigration. I'm just wondering, like, what are, are there any more days you can stack on this calendar, Joe? But again, the religion of the left is leftism. It is not, in fact, Christianity or Catholicism or any form thereof. It is anti these things, which is what was being betrayed. That is why this whole story rings so true for the Biden administration. Because the Biden administration does not represent religious people in this country. They they just don't. I mean, if you look at the, there's a new map that is out from Axios, and it shows the decline in religious service across the United States. Unsurprisingly, the states where fewest households actually attend church, those states are almost universally democratic. The share of adults who say they never or rarely attend religious services exceeds 60% in most of the Northeast, 60% in most of the Northwest, and then in most of the other democratic states, it is 55 to 60% to 60 If you go down south, which is where most of the Republican states are at this point, you know, everything from Texas to South Carolina, you're talking about fewer than 45 percent of households saying they never or rarely attend religious services. What we are watching is a religious breakdown across the country. Joe Biden represents states that tend not to go to church very much. And that is why he has no problem. That's why it never even occurred. That's the thing. Even assume it's a mistake for a second. It never even occurred to them that this might be a problem. And then when notified of the problem, they didn't back off of it. They went strong into it. Because their feeling is that Christianity can be perverted such that it encompasses all progressive worldviews, which is, in fact, insane. It also leads to some pretty weird conflagrations like we saw yesterday at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. So pro Hamas protesters decided now would be an amazing time to break up the Easter service at St. Patrick's, Patrick's Cathedral in New York. And here's what that sounded like. They're literally in the middle of an Easter service and uh, and they decide that they're going to invade the Easter service and pose at the front of the church in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the service before they are removed by security and they start fighting back. So, yeah, these are just delightful people. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful people. And these people should be treated just like anybody else who breaks up a religious service on behalf of their politics. But again, why, why wouldn't they feel this way? Their religion is more important than Christianity. That is why they are in the church. That's why they are doing what they are doing right there. And again, the religion of leftism is one hell of a drug. Obviously, the, the most obvious example of this religion means that you are now standing for Hamas. So over the weekend... The far left basically just declared itself in favor of Hamas, just declared itself against Israel. Israel, by the way, it is worth noting, just carried out one of the great military operations in modern history. Israel just carried out a military operation at Shifa Hospital. So Shifa Hospital, you remember, was a source of major contention because Israel surrounded it and then it waited for for a long time and tried to clear out as many civilians as possible. And Hamas was inside trying to keep the civilians in. Well, Israel had moved most of its forces down south toward Rafah in the Gaza Strip, and that meant that Shifa Hospital was reinvaded and retaken over by Hamas. Israel ended up performing an absolutely incredibly effective military operation in Shifa Hospital. That military operation involved the capture or killing of hundreds of Hamas terrorists. 6,000 civilians were evacuated by the IDF. 200 Hamas terrorists were killed. 500 Hamas terrorists were captured. No civilian was killed. Zero civilians were killed. Didn't matter. The left declared that this was a human rights abuse anyway. So taking over a hospital, not a human rights abuse, killing or capturing only terrorists 
while freeing thousands of civilians. That apparently is a human rights abuse. This presumably is why Jamal Bowman spent the weekend suggesting that the real problem in the Middle East is the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Here he was calling Netanyahu a maniac on national TV, which is amazing for a duller who doesn't know the difference, apparently, between a fire alarm and a door opener. We need a permanent ceasefire. We need to bring in hundreds of trucks that are five miles away from Gaza right now of aid to save as many lives as possible. There's a humanitarian crisis. The majority of Gaza has already been destroyed through acts of collective punishment by this maniac, Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm 100 percent with Senator Schumer. He needs to be removed. He is a blockade to a pathway to peace. And we need a ceasefire right now. That's what we should be focused on. Humanitarian. A pathway to peace. He's the blockade. Not Hamas, the terrorist group that takes over hospitals and builds tunnels underneath civilian areas. Hamas is not the, the barrier. By the way, Israel has accepted pretty much every ceasefire proposal put down that would involve a temporary ceasefire and release of the hostages. Hamas keeps turning it down because they want to survive. And Jamal Bowman is out there standing for Hamas because this is what the far left is. This is the religion. The religion requires acts of fealty. And that act of fealty involves bowing down, as we discussed last week, bowing down deep to actual Islamic terrorists who murder people on the regular and turn an entire area into a terrorist hellhole. We'll get to more on this in a moment. First, there's nothing like sitting behind home plate at a baseball game. When you want the best tickets at any sporting event or concert, you have to act quickly or somebody else is going to get the seat instead. Well, if you're hiring for your business, finding the best people for the job is kind of like that. The best way to get the best person for your job fast is Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter helps you find qualified candidates fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Immediately after you post your job, Zip Recruiter's smart technology shows you qualified people for that role. Amp up your hiring performance with Zip Recruiter and find the best talent fast. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Try it for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Go check them out right now. Get the best employees to fill those positions you need filled right now. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Use the same tool we did when we hire up for Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Try it out for free. Get the world's best employees and get them fast. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. The smartest way to hire. Chris Van Hollen, the idiot senator from Maryland, he is saying the same sort of stuff. He suggests that the United States should hold up aid to Israel in order to save Hamas, apparently. Look, the Biden administration had been planning to submit to Congress a new round of uh, weapons proposals. Uh, They decided not to do that because clearly they knew they would encounter resistance. And so they've essentially done an end run uh, with this earlier version. So my view Uh, Martha, is until the Netanyahu government uh, allows more assistance uh, into Gaza to help people who are literally starving to death, we should not be sending more bombs. This is ridiculous. Israel's been allowing in hundreds of trucks every day. There is literally no one to process them on the other end who is not Hamas. According to the United Nations, about 278 trucks went in every day before October 7th. Today, hundreds of trucks are going in. The only reason more aren't going in is because Hamas is stealing all the aid. So much so that the United States is now idiotically building a pier off the coast. We'll build a pier, the United States, off the coast of the of the Gaza beach before we build a wall on our own border. You want to talk about misallocation of resources. By the way, a bunch of Palestinians just drowned trying to get to that aid on the pier. So things are going amazingly well. And by the way, it also puts American military men and women in harm's way in a very dangerous area for no apparent reason. Because it turns out that even after you get that stuff off the pier, ain't no way to get it to the civilians who are inside Gaza because Hamas is stealing all of it. But again, this is a religion. This is all religious. The religion of leftism requires acts of homage and fealty. You got to put skin in the game on behalf of the world's worst players. Thankfully, you have the morons over at Harvard Law to do this for you. So I'm ashamed today to be a Harvard Law alum. Apparently, the Harvard Law Students Association decided to pass a resolution divesting from Israel, which, like, like Israel cares, and uh, that that's going to stop the war in, in Gaza, apparently, against Hamas. They're, they're going to let Hamas survive because a bunch of 
idiotically indoctrinated left-wing students at Harvard Law School decide that they are very, very mad. The resolution calls on the Harvard management company to divest from Israel over what it calls the genocide of Palestinians. Again, let me be clear. There is no genocide happening in Gaza. If there were genocide happening in Gaza, there'd be hundreds of thousands of dead. Civilians would just be being mowed down. That is not what is happening. The majority of people who have actually been killed are young military age males. Not only that, Hamas is lying about their statistics. Not only that, once again, if Israel had wanted to, for example, bomb Al-Shifa hospital with civilians inside and kill terrorists, it could have done so. It didn't. It cleared 6,000 civilians from Al-Shifa before actually going in. But these people don't care about the truth because, again, this is a religion. It is a religion to them. Facts are of no consequence whatsoever. Here's one of these Harvard Law students speaking about how she is the true hero. She's the real hero. Again, can I just tell you, I, I went to Harvard Law. This is some of the most privileged people on planet Earth. They're not heroic in any way. The people who go to Harvard Law are living in dorm rooms and studying law at one of the richest places on the planet. And then they're going to get out and get $200,000 a year jobs at white shoe law firms in New York. And, and all these people, oh, what, what, he, oh, the heroism, oh. Oh. Okay, pause it right there. This is their story. First of all, it is not your story. You're a Harvard Law student. Second of all, you're co-authoring with the resisting people of Palestine. Do you mean Hamas? Because those would be, at this point, the resisting people of, or the Palestinian Authority or Islamic Jihad. I mean, at least you're putting your, uh, at least you're putting your bona fides out there. This is a religion on the left. And that religion has terrible consequences because its devotees believe truly awful things. It is all of a piece. A war on Easter on behalf of transgenderism or a war on Easter on behalf of Hamas is all part of a coalition that hates Western values. Those Western values are extraordinarily well-based in Christianity. You cannot get through to the destruction of Western values with also, without also destroying Christianity. That's what was going on on Sunday. It's what's been going on a continuous level for decades in this country. And we are now just seeing sort of the apotheosis of that with regard to what's going on in the Middle East. Meanwhile... It is clear that terrorists are feeling their oats these days. We'll get to that in just one second. First, Jeremy's most requested item was natural deodorant. When we released Jeremy's natural deodorant, it was a massive success. Well, now it's back in stock. This natural deodorant is free of chemicals harmful to your body, like aluminum, parabens, sulfates, and phthalates. Woke is toxic, so are a lot of deodorants. Kick out both when you get Jeremy's natural deodorant. Enjoy the salt, stone, and musk scent for men, the water lily and minerals for women, because we believe that men and women are different and should smell different. It's not too sticky, not too greasy. It's just right. Get your Jeremy's natural deodorant at jeremysrazors.com today. Okay, meanwhile, it is obvious that with the West in a state of interior moral collapse, terrorists and bad guys all over the world are on the move. Retired General Ken McKenzie, Commander U.S. CENTCOM, he was on the TVs over the weekend, and he was pointing out that ISIS has basically issued a proclamation to its lone wolves everywhere to attack Christians and Jews wherever they can find them. Very nice people, these ISIS. And uh, here he was explaining that that is quite credible at this point, especially given the mass attack in Moscow. ISIS-K in particular, but, but ISIS in general, uh, has a strong uh, desire to attack our homeland. We should believe them when they say that. Uh, they're going to try to do it. And I, so I think the threat is growing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's begun to grow uh, as soon as we left Afghanistan and took pressure off ISIS-K. So I think we should expect further attempts of this nature against the United States, as well as our partners and other nations abroad. I think this is inevitable. He points out, obviously, that since we left Afghanistan, we have no actual capacity inside Afghanistan to either monitor what's going on or to kill bad guys over the horizon. You remember that that was the lie that the Biden administration told. They said we have over the horizon capability, meaning stuff that we can't see, like directly on the ground, but we'll still have the ability to strike from afar. Mackenzie's like, no, we don't have any of that. ISIS-K has completely rebuilt inside Afghanistan. And now they are going to start spreading their terror tentacles outward, which, of course, literally everyone pointed out when we pulled out a bunch of cowards from Afghanistan under Joe Biden. On the other hand, in Afghanistan, 
we have almost no ability to see into that country and almost no ability to strike into that country. And so ISIS there is able to grow unabated. There's no pressure on them. And again, our operating theory has always been with violent extremists, you want local security forces to be able to control them, and then you want them to not be able to establish the connective tissue internationally that allows them to carry out external attacks abroad. And it's very hard to do that in Afghanistan, where you just don't have the ability to sense, you don't have the ability to strike, uh, very limited resources. Meanwhile, all of America's enemies are apparently on the move. According to CNN, a prominent exiled Iranian journalist was stabbed outside his home in London on Friday, prompting British police to launch a counterterrorism investigation. This person's name was Priya Zarati, television anchor at the UK-based channel Iran International, which is anti-regime, was reportedly attacked by a group of men outside his home in southwestern Wimbledon. The assailants then fled in the car. Apparently, the injuries were not life-threatening. He was in stable condition. Given the victim's occupation, the Met said that coupled with the fact there have been a number of threats directed toward this group of journalists in recent times, the counter, the department's counterterrorism command would be investigating. And of course, we know that basically if you're on Iran's radar, there is a good shot that they will send agents to come and kill you even decades after the fact, which is how Salman Rushdie got stabbed in the eye decades after writing the Satanic Verses. Meanwhile, Russia is assassinating people as well as we know. This is not a big shock. We talked about this a few months back. There was a a defector from the Russian army to the Ukrainian side named Maxim Kuzminov. And he was murdered in Spain just a few months ago. According to the New York Times, the men who killed Maxim Kuzminov wanted to send a message. This was obvious to investigators in Spain even before they discovered who he was. Not only did the killer shoot him six times in a parking garage in southern Spain, they ran over his body with the car. They also left an important clue to their identity, according to investigators, shell casings from 9 millimeter Makarov rounds, a standard ammunition of the former communist bloc. It's a clear message, said a senior official from Guardia Civil, the Spanish police force. I will find you. I will kill you. I will run you over. I will humiliate you. Kuzminov defected from Russia to Ukraine last summer, flying his, his MiG-8 helicopter into Ukrainian tele- territory and handing the aircraft along with a cache of secret documents to Ukrainian intelligence operatives. So he was killed in a seaside resort town uh, in called Via Joyosa last month, and it's raised fear that Russia is going to kill its enemies all over Europe, which, of course, would not be a giant shock. This is something that the Russians have been attempting to do for a while. We are also now getting reports from 60 Minutes that the so-called Havana Syndrome, which is a mystery illness that's been affecting U.S. diplomats in recent years, and that's now been linked to a Russian intelligence unit. Moscow, of course, denies the accusations. Here is 60 Minutes talking about it last night. He has a long track record uncovering Russian documents, and Grozev says he found one that may link 29155 to a directed energy weapon. And when I saw it, I literally had tears in my eyes because it was spelling out what they had been doing. It's a piece of accounting. An officer of 29155 received a bonus for work on, quote, potential capabilities of non-lethal acoustic weapons which told us that this particular unit had been engaged with somewhere, somehow, empirical tests of a directed energy unit. There it is. There it is. Written down in black and white. It's the closest to a receipt you can have for this. According to the BBC, American personnel struck with the condition, including White House, CIA, and FBI staff, have complained of dizziness, headaches, difficulty concentrating, and an intense and painful sound in their ears. This new investigation alleges operatives from Russian military intelligence unit may have targeted the brains of U.S. diplomats with directed energy weapons. Apparently, an American military investigator examining instances of the syndrome told 60 Minutes the common link between the victims was a Russia nexus. His name is Greg Edgreen. He said there was some angle where they had worked against Russia, focused on Russia, and done extremely well. One victim of the syndrome told 60 Minutes about her experience. She said, bam, inside my right ear is like a dentist drilling on steroids. That feeling when it gets too close to your eardrum, it's like that, times 10. So apparently they're they're still trying to figure out exactly what happened here. There have been these reports for years. It's called Havana Syndrome because it first cropped up with U.S. diplomats in Cuba. But there have been these reports from all over the world near areas associated with the Russian government. Now, again, we'll wait for all of that to be tracked down. That's 60 Minutes doing the reporting. Suffice it to say that Russia's enemies, Russia believes that it has them on the run. And why not? All of Russia's enemies are mysteriously dying at this point. So what exactly is Joe Biden doing about any of this? The answer is not much. They're just going to yell about Donald Trump a lot. So Jamie Harrison, the head of the DNC, he says that this election is going to come down to Trump undermining democracy. Uh, Not if the world situation has anything to say about it. The reality is that the map right now for Democrats is incredibly bad. 
The electoral map for Democrats right now shows Donald Trump up in every swing state, including Nevada, pretty solidly, including Wisconsin by just a little bit, including Michigan, very solidly. Democrats are whistling past the graveyard, almost literally in the case of Joe Biden, when they say that they're going to be able to run purely on Trump as a threat to democracy. No one cares what you have to say about Trump at this point because everybody already has an opinion of Trump. The question is, what are people's opinions of your boss? Here's Jamie Harrison, chairman of the DNC. Seeing those three presidents on the stage, these are the things that popped in my head. Honesty, decency, integrity. Those are three servant leaders. And that's something that Donald Trump doesn't know anything about. These people, these are people who understand that this country is about hope over fear. It's about progress over chaos. Uh, and it was amazing to see them there together, unified. And frankly, that is something, and you mentioned this in your opening, that's something that you won't see on the Republican side. I don't think you're going to see George W. Bush on the same stage as, as Donald Trump, because people understand that Trump has become a cancer for American democracy, and they don't want to be affiliated and to stand up with that. Okay, here's the thing. When you say that on a split screen with Stephen Colbert, a late night comedy host, interviewing the last three Democratic presidents on a stage, all of whom were involved in centralization of government power and or corruption, people won't believe you. People think that if they have to choose between the guys they don't trust and don't like, they will pick the guy who at least had a pretty good presidency the first three years before the world imploded because of COVID. Joe Biden has done a terrible job and people know that he's done a terrible job. In fact, even Michael Che, who's a comedian on Saturday Night Live, obviously not on the right. Even Michael Che was ripping on Joe Biden's lack of appeal to black Americans. And the crowd was like, are you allowed to say this? The answer is yes, they are allowed to say this. Joe Biden is not going to get high black turnout. He's just not going to do it. President Biden said Friday that he would visit the site of the Baltimore bridge collapse because like that bridge, Biden is no longer connecting with black communities. <laughs> You got to read the polls. Wow. <laughs> yeah, everybody's surprised you're not allowed to say that. Wow, that's, that's very upsetting. You're mentioning all of that. And then, by the way, SNL then juxtaposed that with a, with a video that Donald Trump put out on Truth Social that showed a truck. And on the back of the truck was painted Joe Biden in the back of the truck, like tied up like, like he'd been kidnapped or something. Probably because Trump thought it was funny. And the entire media was like, that's terrible. How could he do that? He's so immature and terrible. Okay, he can be all of those things. And still, if faced with the prospect of voting for the guy who's immature on Truth Social, but also had a solid economy that was not being handed over to all of the foreign powers in the world, they might take the guy who's immature but was good at the president thing, as opposed to the guy who is beyond his sell-by date and also very, very bad at the president thing. That is the choice that the Biden administration is making clear to the American public right now, and it's not going amazingly well for them. It's more on this in just a moment. First, is the future of America doomed? A majority of Generation Z supports left-wing policies like open borders and socialism. If we don't reach them and change their minds, the country we know and love could be lost forever. PragerU is the leading nonprofit when it comes to influencing young people. Their educational, entertaining, pro-American videos meet young people where they are and open their minds to the truth, but they do need our help. Go to PragerU.com, make a tax-deductible donation. Whatever you give right now will be tripled and have three times the impact. Donate 10 bucks, it triples to 30 bucks. Give 100 bucks, it triples to 300 bucks. PragerU is 100% free to everyone with no fees, no subscriptions. They don't rely on ads or clickbait headlines. Contrary to what the left says, PragerU isn't funded by a handful of billionaires. It's funded by people like you to keep making great content, reaching millions, changing minds. PragerU needs our help. Go to PragerU.com to donate today. We've been working with PragerU for literally a decade at this point. We are basically sister companies with PragerU. They do wonderful, wonderful work helping change minds and thus change the world. Go to PragerU.com to donate today. PragerU.com. Well, meanwhile, the Biden administration, as Michael Chase suggested, not connecting particularly well with the black community, but also not doing an amazing job on this whole Baltimore bridge collapse routine. Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, straight from the cover of Mad Magazine circa 1997, Pete Buttigieg, it turns out, does not instill trust in the American public. Every time he does an interview, I think you feel less secure getting in a plane. Here he was over the weekend suggesting, guys, it's perfectly safe to fly despite the doors that are coming off the Boeings. What would you say to those who are scared to fly right now? 
Well, I, I would say that every time I step onto an airliner, uh, whether I'm uh, going to look at a bridge or whether I'm uh, uh, flying somewhere with my husband and kids, uh, like we will be later this week, I know that I'm participating in the safest form of travel in America and that what makes it the safety, safest form of travel in America is all of the work and all of the people who stand behind that, including uh, the men and women of our FAA. Uh, we're talking about an extraordinary safety record. Uh, and, and just think about this mode of travel. It involves being propelled by flammable liquids in a metal tube through the sky at nearly the speed of sound and, again, is the safest way to travel. My favorite thing is when he starts describing how machines work. I love it. It's great. Like Pete Buttigieg talking about, you know, you should train sometimes to rail, but can you think of a machine moving along the ground at a fairly high rate of speed across metal tracks where the wheels turn and the, the turning of the wheels is generated by power that comes originally from coal, but then later was moved to other fuel sources? Amazing. Just amazing. I love trains. Like, this guy, this one, this is the one who you guys were thinking was like a presidential candidate. OK, then, by the way, it's not just him. He, he did say over the weekend that um, he has learned a lot from Joe Biden, like it's very hard to be president. Yeah, well, Joe Biden makes it look pretty hard. That's that's true. I know when a lot of people see you on television these days, they, they may still think to themselves, oh, I wonder if he still wants the big job one day. Now that you've been closer to it, working alongside a president, is it still something you aspire to? Well, I certainly have a new perspective on just how demanding that job is, watching President Biden uh, deal with so many concerns, mm. challenges, and, and opportunities for this country. And I'm, I'm proud to be a small part of, of the big team that helps him get that done. I sincerely don't know uh, what, uh, uh, whether I will run for elected office of any kind again. What I do know uh, is that I've been asked to take on a big job. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to do it. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's rewarding. And it's taken about 110 percent of what I have to give right now. Wow. It's taking 110% of what he has to give. He doesn't have to give all that much because, you know, paternity leave and all that. Meanwhile, I do love that, again, the backups to Joe Biden are Pete Buttigieg and Kamala Harris. According to Reuters, hosting rapper Fat Joe at the White House to talk about reforming marijuana laws, visiting an abortion clinic, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza at the historic Selma Bridge in Alabama, walking the blood-stained crime scene of the Parkland, Florida school shooting. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has stepped out of the shadow of President Joe Biden in recent weeks as part of a high-profile effort to persuade the fractious coalition of voters who sent them to the White House to give them a second term. I can't think of anything much more off-putting than that list of little performances that Kamala Harris is doing. Wow. I mean, now I definitely want to vote for the ticket that hosted Fat Joe at the White House to talk about pot and visited an actual abortion clinic and went to the Selma Bridge to jabber about why Hamas needs to be preserved and to go to Parkland, Florida. I mean, wow. That is the kind of governance that I think America could use. According to USA Today, Harris's evolving role comes as progressive Democrats target Biden over his pro-Israel stance. Polls show him in a tight race against Republican rival Donald Trump. As left-leaning voters question Biden's age and leadership, a problem Trump doesn't face with his core voters, the 59-year-old Harris is taking on a more heated topic more often and more directly than Biden. She's moved into the starring role. Another time for another look at Kamala. I love that they relaunch Kamala Harris every five minutes. Every five minutes, they relaunch Kamala Harris. It's like, a time-condensed Batman relaunch. Like, there's a relaunch of the Batman series every 10 years or so. For Kamala Harris, like, every 15 minutes. It's like, another look at Kamala. Oh, my God, she's terrible. Can we please hide her in a closet? Somewhere? Well, maybe it's time for another look at Kamala. Oh, no, she's out again? Put her back. We can't have her out there. She's terrible. Maybe, maybe time, it's time to look at Kamala for, like, the 82nd time. There was this joke during the Trump administration. This is the day Donald Trump finally becomes president, whenever he would act presidential. And then five minutes later, you have, like, a sign in the corner that said, days since acting unpresidential, set it back to zero. That's Kamala Harris, except it's days since being unbelievably annoying and terrible in every possible way. And she gets to like day one, and then they set it back to zero. If your great hopes, Democrats, are that people are going to not be super enthused about Joe Biden, but they will love the prospect of Kamala Harris taking over when he dies, good luck to you. Good luck to you. Again, the single best insurance Joe Biden has that he won't be ousted as the nominee is that he picked somebody even less popular in Kamala Harris. All righty. Coming up, we're talking with Alexandra Hudson. She has a brand new book called The Soul of Civility, Timeless Principles to Heal Society and Ourselves. Civility, is that still a thing? If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.